Uh, with us now is uh, Xavier Ho, uh, presenting his first PyCon talk. And Xavier is a curiosity-driven researcher and software engineer. Oh, uh, there, there's markdown links in this. Unfortunately, I can't render links in my speech, so you're just going to bear with me. Um, he works for CSRIRO, creating interactive data visualizations. Uh, currently pursuing a PhD part-time at the Design Lab at University of Sydney. Uh, keeps him busy, and he sometimes wonders about machines and humans and that philosophical lot. Uh, previously, Xavier worked in a Sydney startup doing computer vision work, uh, freelance as a videographer, and taught a handful of programming classes to university design students. His passion lies somewhere in the spectrum of chocolates, video games, and a better world, and you can find him on Twitter. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you, Sam. Uh, can everyone in the back hear me as well? Okay, I can see nods. Thank you. So today I'm going to give you a, a quick tutorial on how you might clean up messy data sets. So if you've been to um, the previous two talks on documentation, this is a tutorial. I'm going to walk you very slowly on how you might go from getting a data set to something that you can use uh, for production. So uh, this talk will also be online. In fact, I've already posted it on Friday on Slack, so you don't have to take any notes. And everything is in the Jupyter Notebook, so feel free to run through the examples afterwards as well. And um, I'll hang out for questions at the end. In fact, I aim to have at least five minutes at the end of this session. So feel free to uh, ask questions or tag me on Twitter, come up and chat with me later. Okay, so um, just to kind of refer to the other two talks that were really excellent. If you want to work with data, whether it's in science, finance, any kind of fields, uh, in the last two days, we've seen lots of talks on uh, how you might go about working with data sets. So in particular, I want to kind of shout out to Tennessee and Claire's talk on using data sets in hackathons and Python and also visualizing them as well. And in particular, Claire also did a shout out on the PyCon US talk on the visualization talk, which is also excellent. Check them out. Um, and let's just begin. So since I work at CSRO, we have to have a little bit of science. And the motivation for this talk is we want to make sure that we have healthy water that we can use. So there is this thing called the aquatic microorganisms. They thrive and die with seasonal temperatures. When things get warmer, they multiply. When things get colder, they tend to not be able to live as easily. And these things are called cyanobacteria, at least a category of them, or called uh, commonly blue-green algae. They produce oxygen in water, and they're the only sort of organism in this category that can do so. So if your water in like a natural lake or uh, in a river is oxygen poor for whatever reason, they're the reason why the fish can breathe. So having a good number of them in your lakes are very, very important in our ecosystem. So unfortunately, when you have too many of them, uh, they can be toxic for, depending on the species, they actually will poison you. Uh, some of them will just kind of make you have a stomach ache or throw up if you happen to drink them by accident. So you know, having too little is bad. Having too much is bad. So we need to sort of like monitor and mo moderate a number of uh, cell cyanobacteria in our water. And what we can do about that is uh, using weather data, we can hopefully find out what kind of uh, numbers that might be in the river and try to keep them in the mount. And I just realized with my slides, the resolution is a bit different. So I may have uh, cut off the number of lines I can show. So in short, uh, we can predict and track cyanobacteria and keep our water safe and healthy to use. So let's take a look at our weather data sets. And these are commonly things you can find on the Bureau of Meteorology or other weather report sites. So in this talk, we'll be using Pandas for data wrangling. Uh, you can install Pandas with your favorite uh, package manager like Anaconda, Miniconda, Pip, and so on. And um, give me a moment because I'm going to quit this presentation because the resolution is too small. So I'm going to actually show you use, uh, using the Jupyter Notebooks. So, this way, you can actually read everything I'm writing here. OK. So uh, to begin, there are two functions that we'll be using. Uh, there's pandas.read uh, under CSV, which opens a CSV file for you. There are comma-separated files, pretty common. You can see it for open government data sets and so on. They open it as a data frame, which in pandas uh, talk is a table. So in a data frame, you'll have a column, uh, you'll have a bunch of indexes, and you usually have more than one rows of content. In a data frame, there's a really convenient function called head, which will show you the first five rows in the table. So uh, the first thing is that we can read a CSV file. So I was really hoping to show you this in the presentation, but because you see how big it is, it's not really going to work, right? So we'll go here. Right. So here, I'm just importing pandas as pd. It's a common uh, way to refer to pandas. It's three less characters, I suppose, or four less characters. And I'm going to read a file that's already in my folder called um, Canberra Under Observations. 
So let's have a look at this. Okay, so I've opened the file. It appeared to have read everything as one giant string. It's a little bit strange. Um, I can see there are backslash T's here, there are tab characters. So the file is not actually comma separated, but tab separated. Uh, there's time, there's Wednesday. We know that's Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And there's, I guess, some kind of wind direction. Uh, there's some numbers and following and so on. So there's a bit of a trouble in just you know, understanding the file. Luckily, with Pandas, uh, it's really versatile for uh, keyword arguments. So in the read under CSV function, um, there are a couple of keyword arguments that we'll be using. The first one is sep, or stands for separator. So you can say, instead of you know, commas, I might be using tabs, or I might be using white spaces, and so on. Next, there are three things we can use to tell Pandas how to pass time better. So the first one is pass under dates. Uh, you can treat one or more columns as a date or time or daytime columns, which can let Pandas know that this is actually time instead of just strings. And the next thing, uh, because we're in Australia, the time formats start usually date, month, year, or year, month, day, unlike the month, day, year confusing formats. Uh, you can tell Pandas that actually our uh, data is day first instead of month first. Save you that little extra trouble that you have to pass things. Uh, and the third one is really beautiful. It's called infer under data time under formats. Uh, Pandas will uh, try to guess the date formats if you're passing this and set it to true. And the good thing about this is that once you say to try to infer it and if Pandas can get it right, you'll generally see a large uh, speed performance in passing larger data sets than just trying to pass everything one by one. Lastly, you can tell Pandas what data sets or values are not really valid. Uh, by default, it will treat something like NAN or no number is invalid. But in our data sets, uh, there are other things which can also be invalid. It's really hard to spot, but there's a little dash here. So we can now pass in these things as uh, values that we should ignore or treat as empty. So uh, let's read the file in the Pandas way. First of all, uh, we will just add a separator character, and we can run this thing. So you can see that now we have a table that Pandas has correctly passed to be uh, multiple columns, and there's an index, and there's a bunch of data sets. Now, because the dates are still in strings, and so is time, I'm going to tell Pandas that actually my date time uh, consists of two columns, date and time, and I'm going to call it date time. And I'm also going to say, yes, please, uh, you know, it's date, month, year, because I got it from an, an Australian site. I know the formats, and please try to infer it. And lastly, I also set the dash to be an empty value as well. So if I run this, it will take a little bit of time because I have a whole year that I set in there. But hopefully in a couple of seconds, uh, you will now see that I've passed the daytime to be the correct format. And it's show me in an ISO format um, of this without the time zone. Um, I will have a caveat in this talk. I'm not dealing with time zones. There was an excellent talk earlier as well to deal with time zones. So uh, I think we got all the corners covered. There is wind direction and wind speed and so on. And you can see now it's displayed uh, the wind speed instead of a dash to be not a number. Uh, another note is that in Pandas, when you see not a number in the table, it's actually not the IEEE floating point on a number. It's just Pandas where to say this value is empty. OK, let's moving on. So there's a couple of things we have to do in terms of data cleaning. And actually, go back for a little bit. You can see that the starting point is the 1st of January at midnight, OK? The next thing is the 1st of January at 11.30 PM, or 23.30, which is kind of strange. We're going you know, jumping 11 hours, or so which midnight is this? It's really confusing. And then it's kind of going backwards in time, which is even stranger. And in fact, if you were to play with this a little bit, and I'm going to show you using the Python slicing syntax, and I'm going to show the first, perhaps, 58 some columns, which will take some time because I'm repassing it again. Uh, it gets a little bit stranger. So you can see I've started at midnight, whichever midnight that is. Uh, and then it's 11.30, it goes back in time, goes back in time. And then you get to the beginning of the day of the 1st of January, which is around here. It's not going to the second the next day at midnight, whichever midnight that is. And then it goes backwards in time. So the data sets don't always come you know, in the right order. It doesn't always come in the right format. And plus, there's ambiguity. So this is where we go back to the beginning uh, when we were passing the thing and then trying to find out what's going on here. So if I were to come in this out again and then just keep the separator and then just pass it, you can see that uh, there is a Wednesday thing here and there's a Tuesday thing here. 
because I've currently discarded the, the time zones, uh, Pandas just treats time as whichever hours and time that it's able to find. And therefore, it's now shown, well, it doesn't really know which day it is anymore. Uh, well, you can look up on, on the calendar. The first day of January in 2013 is, in fact, a Tuesday. So this Wednesday at midnight, by common convention, is actually the next day, which is a little bit confusing, but okay. So I'm just going to uh, keep that in mind and pass it back. And that's going to run, so it'll run in a little bit. Okay, so we know the first row is actually the 2nd of January, and then it's going back in time until the beginning of the day. And then it's going to go to the 2nd of January um, at the end of the day, and then it goes back in time. So we have to kind of fix this, just so we can use it a little bit more uh, sane. So there's a couple of things, like each day includes midnight and then the midnight, um, and then the order starts you know, at the end of day. Luckily, uh, Pandas offers some functions to help us. So the next three functions are built into the data frame, which is a table you open after reading the CSV. The first thing is drop under duplicates. You can tell Pandas to get rid of duplicate roles. In this case, we've got the beginning or the end of day, midnight, and the uh, end of the day, which is the beginning, which is really confusing, but there's two midnights per one day, so we'll get rid of one of them. Uh, secondly, we can tell Pandas to sort the values. So just to tell us, sort it in ascending, descending order, and so on. And lastly, we will set the index. Instead of using uh, numbers, we can use the time as our index. So I've got a code here. Um, the previous variable I've set was called weather observations, and I'm just going to say, please drop the duplicates and keep the last one, because I know the first one was, in fact, the next day, so I don't really want that duplicate. So you can see that we've got the uh, last, well, I suppose the second last time stamp on the first day, and then it's still going on. Then the next thing I'm going to do is to say, um, please sort the values for me, and I'm going to copy paste this so I can show you what a sorted thing looks like. So pandas by default sorts ascending, uh, in ascending order, which means it's going to go from small to big. So I've got the beginning um, of January 1st, which is correct, and then it's going to go uh, to the next time point, and so on. Uh, lastly, because these numbers on the left-hand side don't make sense anymore, they're just numbers that came into my data reading, I'm going to say, please use uh, the time as my index. So I'm going to call the set index function, and then just pass in the date time, uh, which is the name of our column here. And as before, I'm going to put that here so I can visualize what it looks like. Okay, so now we have a table which has the correct index, hopefully, if time is your uh, data to identify which uh, row it is. We still have wind directions, there's still some empty values, and so on. Okay, so the next thing that we can do is that when you work with data sets, especially in a scientific context, you want to make sure you can uh, read the numbers, uh, whether they're a string or something, so that the machine can understand it better. Especially when you're modeling uh, weather data, uh, telling the computer this is east and north is perhaps not as good as a number that it can model in a direction. So uh, commonly by, I suppose, um, consistency, they've decided that north wind, which is a north to south wind, is zero degrees, and then it will go clockwise. So in this case, east wind, which is going from east to west, is 90 degrees, and so on. So we need to transform these values that are like east, north, east, and uh, south, southwest, and so on, to be a number so we can use it in modeling later. So pandas has a function that you can use to transform your values. It doesn't matter if it's string to numbers or numbers to string or any other for, uh, kind of data type, really. You can use a function called series.apply. Now, a series in pandas is just a column in a data frame. So I can get a particular column, and I'm going to apply a transformation function to it so that I can change the east, north, east, and so on to be a number that I can use later. Okay, so um, I don't know about you, you can write your fancy functions to pass north, east, and intelligently to get the correct numbers out of it. In my case, I just kind of dumped it in Excel, generated the numbers out of it, and then I put them in a Python dictionary format because I know there's only 16 different directions in terms of how the uh, directions for wind are recorded. And um, I can then pass this as a dict, and then down here, I'm just going to access the data frames column using the Python normally you will access a dict. Uh, this gives you a series, which is a column. I'm going to use its own function called apply, and I'm going to pass a transformation function to it. Here I've passed the .get function, which is the uh, built-in function to our dictionary. So um, if this looks a little bit confusing, I can make it a little bit easier for you to read. So this is equivalent to say I'm going to pass in a function, 
which is called lambda. And the lambda takes you know, perhaps a argument called x. And here I'm going to say, uh, just give me the value that the dict uh, has whatever x index is. And by default, if you don't find it, just please um, return none or a null value in Python. So what this is doing, um, it's saying for each item on my column in the series, pass it to this function. So this x will be taking the first value uh, to be if, uh, east, north, east, and followed by another number, and so on and so forth. So what it's doing then is it will look up the data set here, and east, north, east is 67.5, I suppose. And if it doesn't exist, it's just going to get a none uh, back. So uh, this will run, and oops, this is just interesting. Let's see what happens here. Live demos, so this happens a lot. Uh, name, ah, forgot to run the previous column. This is not great. Let's try again. So now I've transformed uh, the column from whatever string that was to a number, and I've preserved the another number uh, back here. OK, so the next thing that I want to talk about is that the data set may not always be regular. And I'll show you what I mean. Here's an interesting section I found in the data set. It takes a little bit uh, to find it. You can plot it. You can scroll in, uh, in your file and so on. But you'll eventually find things like this. Um, that's 33 minutes, OK? That's 1 o'clock. That's 1.11. Well, I don't know why. 1.11, OK. 1.30. OK, so I've definitely got the half an hour timestamps here. But then there's also an extra data set that I'm not really sure why it's there, but it's there. And it's just treated like any other column. So in your data sets, it's really important to go through and then trying to find out where, what these things exist. Um, generally, I actually found this. I just opened a file in a text editor, scroll through a little bit, and just found really weird timestamps. So you have to look at it really carefully. So um, there is a function in uh, Pandas, again, in a data frame called as freq or as frequency. You can say, given this index, please interpret it to be a set frequency so that we can say it's always increasing by one, or in our case, it's time, it's every 30 minutes. So let's look at how we can set data frequency. So my data frame currently is called this variable, and I'm going to call the function as freq, and I'm going to just passing 30 minutes. You can say one day or one hour as well. And let's just run that. So here I've looked at a different slice in my data set, and I've purposely chosen this magic number because this number matches the same day, which is the 4th of February. If you look back here, that's the 4th of February at the beginning of the, uh, of the day. And you can see now I've gotten rid of the 11 and 33 minutes. And Pandas will have gone through this entire table. And what ice frequency will do is if it found a data time point that's not in a correct frequency, it will discard it. Um, if it finds things that's only really close and there's nothing there, it will also discard it. If it finds things that's in the correct frequency, it will keep it. So there's a caveat there. If you want to keep your data sets and you don't want to discard it, there perhaps could be other ways to transform it. But here I've chosen to discard the extra data sets that's not in the frequency that I'm using. OK, so let's look at how to plot the data for a better picture. Um, as before, you can select multiple columns uh, in your data frame. So in this case, I'm maybe interested in the wind speed and the wind gust, which is the sudden rush, the maximum recorded uh, wind speed in that time frame. I'm also going to look at the temperature and how cold or how hot it feels like, which should be correlated in some way. And I'm going to get the first 500 uh, indexes in this case, and I'm just going to call the dot plot function. So pandas by default piggybacks with matplotlib. So it will just plot the data set in a fashion that uh, looks good by itself, by default. OK. So did you notice anything interesting here? There is actually a gap uh, just around here. I can probably zoom in for you. You can see there's a gap uh, between those two data points. And there's a gap there as well. And if you were to uh, look in the data set a bit more carefully, you'll probably see more gaps. And what this is that it could be because the sensor dropped off um, or the recording data set came in different chunks. And when someone put it together, there was a time that nothing was recorded, right? So there's also these kind of gaps we have to be wary about. Now, we can um, actually clean this up in many ways. You can say, if the data set doesn't exist, um, I'm going to choose to set a default value. Or I'm going to choose to ignore that time frame in my analysis. Or perhaps you might want to keep uh, the features of the data set. 
So we'll look at how we can interpolate it so that we can connect the broken joints to the next bit. And you have perhaps a linear uh, interpolation in this case, but you can also choose to do uh, quadratic or cubic in which you look at more than two data points and try to make a sensible line between uh, the, the samples. Okay, so um, there is a function, luckily, Pandas is really, really awesome, called interpolate. It works on the column, uh, which is the series, and it will try to fill empty values uh, based on index. So what it does, by default, is a linear interpolation. It will look at anything that's not a number or empty. It will look at the neighboring values from before and after. And because we've already told Pandas, that the index is in fact a time which has some kind of order, it's able to work out whether this point is at, you know, how close is it, uh, is it to the next and before and work out a value exactly at the middle or along that transition line. Okay, so uh, here I'm just using a simple for loop. Um, in Pandas, you can do the dot columns, which is for a data frame, you can get a list of columns and I'm just gonna iterate through. So for each column, I'm going to, um, again, pass it in here to access it, so I'm getting the series. For each series, I'm going to call the interpolate function. I'm going to say my index um, is a time series, so please interpolate it as time. There's other things like uh, numbers and other things you can look at the documentation. Um, and I'm also gonna say in place equals true, and pandas supplies many functions that support this keyword argument. What it does is instead of assigning it to a new variable, it will do it on its own so I can save memory. So let's run that. So you can see before, uh, on the 4th of February, there was two not a number values, and now there's a number that's magically filled in, and because the before and after are the same numbers, 67.5, it's just kind of filled the same number. And also, to be sure, we can plug it again, and you can see that the things in the middle is now a straight line, and it's guaranteed every 30 minutes, there is a value somewhere in there that you can use. And the beauty of this is that when you uh, do a simulation, typically by uh, increasing a time step, you can just say, get the next row, I know it's 30 minutes, and I'm gonna get the next value, so everything is at a fixed time frequency, and the value will be meaningful in some form with the caveat that we built into this data set, and you can now use it to a simulation. So, yeah, the data set is now ready to be used for modeling, and you know you can use it confidently in a way that you hopefully clean it up. So um, that's just uh, starting to wrap up. So you too can keep the water healthy. You can work with data sets that come with all kinds of weird things. You can discard them as empty values. You can fill them in in a meaningful way, um, hopefully. And today I've just kind of gone through a series of uh, the basic steps that hopefully everyone will encounter at some point if you have to work with a tabular data set. So reading a file, how to sort your documents and data sets, uh, transforming columns from string to numbers or from any other logic. Uh, you can regulate your frequency, that can be time, can be numbers, uh, can be anything that has an order really. You can interpolate and fill in missing data and what I didn't show is that you can also fill all the way before the beginning of the index or after the end, so it's able to kind of project as well. And finally, just to use the dot plot function to go back to matplotlib and just kind of have a quick look of what's going on. So I really encourage, if you want to use pandas and if you uh, haven't used it before, to check out the, the, the documentation so that you might find more gems in there because um, I'm gonna have to do a full disclosure. About a month ago, I haven't used pandas. I did this project all in Python. And then when I was about to give a talk, I'm like, hmm, should I give a talk on this messy code that I just wrote? Or, ooh, there's pandas, I should learn it. And I found all these functions that did exactly what I was doing. So I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So I found all the functions that I was able to hopefully teach uh, in ways you can just call in one function or two. And that would pretty much do exactly the same thing. Right, so again, the slides will be available, which is right here. I'm gonna go back to presentation mode and skip right to the end, which is here. Uh, that's where the slide lives. Uh, there's a bonus section on combining two data frames if you're interested to look at it. So what I'm doing there is I've got one uh, weather data and I've got a cloud observation data. They have different frequencies and different attributes. I will show you how to sort of join them in there as well. So if there's not enough uh, questions at the end of this talk, I, I can also go through that. Uh, feel free to be friends on Twitter. I'm pretty chatty, um, currently still having too many tweets. Otherwise, feel free to come up and talk to me and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, that's the talk.
So all right. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Um, Xavier, there's, I think, a fantastic first PyCon talk. Thank you. Um, here is a mug from the conference as a token of their appreciation. I open the floor for questions. Right here. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, so with the interpolation, um, so for, I'm guessing for modeling purposes, you might want to set a flag on those values that they're actually interpolated and not the real values from the sensor. Is, do you have any experience with doing that in Pandas? Yeah, so actually when you interpolate the values in Pandas, uh, it changes the internal uh, representation from a series to a, I think it's a interpolated or frequency or something series. So uh, internally, Panda knows that this column has been transformed to be a frequency. If you're using interpolation, which is what you were probably asking, and just filling a value, uh, Pandas doesn't know that this thing has been interpolated in a linear fashion where there were gaps. So what you might have to do is then in your data store, if you were to use uh, commonly for scientific data sets, you will have metadata for your columns. You might leave a note and say this has been uh, interpolated where there were gaps. And um, you can also supply another column and say these are the gaps that were null and these are the, the gaps that, um, sorry, these are where their values. So you can always add more connotations to your data set to make it more meaningful and be able to trace back. Questions? I intended this to be a Q&A at the end as well because I know you have specific questions and I'm happy to answer them. Um, so you showed the linear interpolation. Do you know of any other interpolation methods um, that might work on, say, noisier data or, um, or for larger gaps? Yes. Uh, so there's two things I want to point you to. In Pandas, it does interpolation only uh, linearly unless you pass it to be like cubic or something. Also, SciPy, scientific, scientific Python, has a lot more functions you can do and say, give me a window, smooth it out, which is a way you might uh, to combat noise. So you can say uh, smooth it so that you only take um, every two hours as your timestamp. But my data set has been every half an hour. But in this case, because I'm smoothing over perhaps four or more values, I might be able to get a better sense of where the data is instead of this noisy gap. And if you were to interpolate in the larger window, sometimes you have to decide if this is, you know, if it's a gap that's over one hour, it might be acceptable to do a linear one. If the gap is one year, you're gonna have to look somewhere else, right? So at some point you have to decide what is the acceptable quality for my data set. Can I interpolate it and still make it meaningful? And when you do, you have to note it. And if you can't, then you, we, what we usually do is then we try to synthesize two or more data sets, put them in the same frequency, clean them up, combine them, and then you will have a meaningful uh, data set that's larger that you can use. Yep. Uh, we got time for one or two more. Anybody else? So um, I had to try and use pandas before for uh, dealing with uh, water quality data. And I had to put up with things like um, people typing O instead of zero for floating point numbers, um, which pandas couldn't handle. And ultimately, I had to do some ugly hacks to get around. Uh, is pandas better at handling this now? OK, so let me show you something. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I've got this bonus section, I'll show you a couple of things. So I've got a, a cloud data set, which I'll, I'll quickly run through them and just read some stuff. Now you can see most of the values here are, you know, none or not a number, but then you get clear out of uh, one over eight. So you're like, okay, so is that a number? What does clear mean? You have to look up, right? I found out clear means there's no cloud, so zero. Um, but you still have to deal with people entering, you know, like manual uh, annotations. So what you can do in Pandas now, and this has been there before, you can say, show me the data types. So it's able to work out, hey, everything inside this current weather, uh, 64-bit floating point, at least that's how it's stored internally. But for cloud, it's an object. So that's like Python's way to say, this is anything, could be anything. So uh, what you can do then is you can say, give me a you know, list of unique values that's in uh, this column. And now I can see there's you know, one over eight and so on. There's clear, there's also a null value. So this is where I can figure out, okay, someone has typed in something that's not what's intended to be there. And I can write functions you know, using apply that we've seen before to transform that to combat these values. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, all we got time for up. That last thing is actually really slick. Thank you. Um, so one more round of applause for Xavier. Thanks. And so uh, that concludes the session. I, my prayers tell me that there should be tea and uh, biscuits out there, so please go enjoy. <laughs>